Let me tell you what happened when they, the days after they brought in this bill, because we said it was dead on arrival. Originally, the Liberals said, oh, maybe we can live with it. And I said, and so I grabbed one of them in the lobby by the arm. I said, what are you, what are you talking about? 2040, man. And he said, well, you know, I don't know. We're liberal. It's tough, you know. And I said, no, 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 no. So I phoned some environmental friends and I said, talk to the liberals. Get their heads screwed on straight. And so then a day later, being liberals, they changed their mind and said, sorry, we can't support it. So the bill was dead. Dead on arrival. And everyone said, oh, well, this parliament's done. And I've been to the UN meetings, I've been to these climate change conferences, and I've seen the evidence. And the one thing I know, the one thing I know, is we don't have the luxury of time. Time's not on our side on this issue. Of all the things we have going for us, our smarts, our dedication, our ability to adapt, the one thing we don't have going for us is time. And so Jack came to me in the, in the house one day, and he said, I'm going I'm to ask Harper a question. And I said, oh, no, what are you going to ask him? Jack's a pretty... Uh, aggressive fellow sometimes, <laughs> and he said, I'm going to ask him to give us the bill. Give us the bill in such a way that we can rewrite the whole thing. And I said, he's not going to go for it, Jack. This is Harper. He doesn't like that. He's arrogant. He's controlling. He's all these things. And he said, we got to try something. we got to try something. And we'll do it with the other parties, and we'll get everybody to agree. And I remember sitting behind him as he stood up, and I was all nervous, and I was grabbing my desk, and he said, Prime Minister's bill is dead on arrival. It's a no-go. Will he work with us and the other parties in this place to come together, put our best ideas on the table, and rewrite it? And all the conservatives sitting beside me where they sit in the House of Commons started slamming their desks and carrying on like a bunch of bohemians, going, Jack, sit down. Jack, you're no good. You don't know nothing, Jack. And then Harper got up and said, OK. <laughs> and so then I turned to the conservatives and said, oh, you don't know about this. Oh, you, did. you didn't know this. Way to go, Jack. You did it. And we had a, we had a good moment. And they were quiet for a minute. It was, that's a rare moment for me in the House. And so then we designed this committee. All the parties sat on the committee. First week, we started hearing witnesses. We heard more and more witnesses from all sides. And they all told us the same thing. They said, get on with it. Industry said, get on with it. Average Canadians, who I think are far, far ahead of the politicians on this issue, said, get on with it. And then we got to the time to rewrite the bill. So in the true spirit of getting on with it, the Conservatives canceled the first set of meetings. <laughs> and the media all said, told you so, it can't be done. Politicians just don't get along. And I said, no, we're not done yet. And so then we got to our second meeting, and the, the Conservatives were let, ready, and we were ready, and, and so then the Liberals came in, and. And they canceled those set of meetings. And the media said, it can't be done. And Elizabeth May got up and said, I told you so, it can't be done. And so then we had an emergency meeting of the executive of this committee. And I sat around the table. And we came into the room, and I dropped down on the table 20 hours of meetings in three days, because we had a deadline. And I said, I want 20 hours of meetings in three days. We're going to rewrite this thing. Bring your ideas. Show up ready to work or forget it. And lo and behold, they all said yes. And so we started Monday night, just this last week. Wow. Now, understand how this thing works. It's a beast of a bill. And I'm going to go through some of the things that happened. It's a bill that affects another bill and affects two other bills. So every time we made a change to the one bill, we affected three other bills almost all the time. And you want to hear about complicated lawmaking? This was the textbook on it. Because when the chair starts reading out the subclause dash 3013B slash 204, with reference to number 106, not 107, <laughs> and you're flipping through the bill and the other three bills, it's complicated. You start with these good intentions, and then it just goes, wow. And we went nuts. And Jerry, who works with me in Ottawa, and a few of our other core staff around the table, went late, most nights, every night, negotiating, online, offline, over the side, getting this thing together. And this is what came out of it. We, in this country, do not internalize the cost of pollution. Companies, when you look on their spreadsheets and they, they add up their accounts, can tell you the costs of things, right? What's it cost for paint? What's it cost for the employees? What's insurance cost? But when you say, where do you put pollution? There ain't no line for that. There's just no place to capture it. So when, it, when you hire an employee, you pay tax. But when you send something up the smokestack, you don't pay anything. That's free. That's what we call a tragedy of the commons. 
especially when you talk about our, our climate. We put hard caps into this bill for industry, for all the major polluters in this country, which represent 50% of all the greenhouse gas emissions that go on in this country. Beyond that cap, they pay. And here's the fun thing that we slipped in right at the end there. They pay into a fund, which they can draw down for to make those changes to their industrial processes, clean up their act. And if they don't do that after a couple of years, we give the money to you to retrofit your homes. I, I hope they actually draw down the money and change their business practices. For those that don't, though, I just can't wait <laughs> to see you folks retrofit your homes with money from Exxon. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that, that'll feel extra good. <laughs> Slap in the new windows, get a new door. You can call it the Exxon door. You can call it the Trans Alta window. That'll be fun. We, uh, we brought in uh, an amendment that will give Canada a mandatory law to have the most efficient automobiles set at the benchmark of the best in the world, okay. starting in 2001 so that the cars made in this country will finally start to lead the world, not fall behind the world in terms of efficiency. And everyone screamed and yelled. We actually had a conservative member on, on the committee that claimed that if we did anything environmental about the auto industry, there would be an increase in suicide and spousal abuse. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> in his communities in Windsor. Personal experience? That's the, uh, <laughs> here's another fun thing we did. We put in, and the Tories moved this, the Conservatives moved this. We drafted it, they rewrote it. We said, knock yourselves up, put it in. An idea of hot zones, special zones in the country that we know are being affected by climate change. The government has to focus its energy, its attention, and its money into those places first. We're particularly thinking of the far north, which is going through massive changes right now, and places that are being infested by the pine beetle, which go across right now the forests of northern British Columbia, the interior, okay, okay. and now across the boreal, as you folks in Alberta are coming to meet the pine beetle. We uh, brought in a, a principle that Linda will know well called the substitution principle. That says when Canada is analyzing the air pollutants that go up into the air, it seeks to find a substitution for that pollution first. So a company is doing its little business and up goes the smokestack and up there goes all these pollutants. The government has never had a policy that says, is there any way to replace those bad chemicals in your process? So that you just don't make them in the first place, and then they don't go up the stack in the second place, and we don't have to deal with them in the third place. Can you substitute? Oh, yeah. We've never had that. It's the highest order of pollution prevention you can do. Because yeah. it says, just don't make the pollution in the first place. <laughs> and I've got a bill in the parliament right now that's going into its last stages, called the phthalates bill. There's, there's this chemical they put into plastics yeah. to make it soft. We're calling it the rubber ducky bill. Because <laughs> the problem with this stuff, these phthalates, it's a group of chemicals, they're noxious stuff. They're called endocrine disruptors. They harm particularly small children, boys, pregnant women, and they make plastic soft. <laughs> Not this one. <laughs> and they are released when you, uh, when you mouth them. And there are substitutions available. But we don't have any substitution law in this country that says an industry must first check substitutes before it puts it in. We go the reverse way. And that's just stupid. We put in uh, short, medium, and long-term targets for our greenhouse gas pollution on a national scale that would put us back in line with the international community. Meet Kyoto obligations, move on beyond to 2020, and then move on to 2050 on a reasonable timeline. Lastly, we put in national air quality standards, mandatory. We don't have them in this country. The United States does. We never have. We don't have a standard that goes across the country that says this is how the air must be. This is how good the air must be to breathe. We've just never had it. Canadians are waking up to a lot of this and realizing that the trust and confidence we had in our governments to protect our health and our environment was often misplaced that we just don't do things like this, and now we have.